with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jeff Lee, and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. Please be sure to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids at Jedly Magic on Twitter, at Reading With Your Kids on Instagram. Our goal is to help you grow closer together as a family by inspiring you to read more together. Our guest today is Jen Moon Spalding. She'll be here to celebrate her beautiful picture book series, The Adventures of Lily. She's also going to let us know about something called hyperlexia. Before Jen joins us to tell us all about hyperlexia and the adventures of Lily, we want to let you know all about the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program. If you're a parent, you want to check out our Certified Great Read Hall of Fame. There you're going to find some great books that are worthy of your consideration. You're not going to love every single book, but every book that you'll see on that Hall of Fame has been been awarded four or five out of five stars by our panel of teachers, parents, and kids. So you can be assured that there's a really good chance that you're going to want to add one of those books to your family library. Now, if you're an author, you definitely want to check out our Certified Great Read program because it's a great way to let parents know that that your book is worthy of their consideration. It really helps your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single month. Do you know there are thousands of children's books published every single month? Yeah, I'm not kidding. They're they literally, and it's really, really hard to, to get your book noticed amongst that crowd of books. This is something that's really helped a lot of authors. Check it out today. Whether you're a parent or an author, go to readingwithyourkids.com. Check out our Certified Great Read program. Joining us right now from Lexington in the great state of Kentucky, we're here to celebrate her wonderful series, The Adventures of Lily. Please welcome to the show, Jen Noon Spalding. Jen Noon, how are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to have you today because um, we're going to be talking about your books that are based on your incredible daughter. And, and in talking about your books, we're going to be able to talk about a really important issue, the issue of, uh, of, of sensory challenges that, that kids face. Am I right about that? Oh, yes, most definitely. So can you tell us about the latest book in the Adventures of Lily series? Okay, so the latest book that I have in my series is called No Kiss, No Hug. And No Kiss, No Hug basically is about the fact that Malia, my daughter Lily, um, she had sensory issues to touch. And that could look like several different things. Some children have uh, issues with their clothes or their socks or, but in our case, Our daughter didn't like for people to hug her, and she really didn't like kisses. You know, sometimes she would let us hug her, but she just didn't like all of that. Mm -hmm. And so my parents are – I'm originally from Tennessee, and so the book takes place um, in Tennessee, basically. We were traveling to Tennessee, and the book starts um, with Malia just being excited about going to Tennessee – but she was worried about her Mima and Pops hugging and kissing her because she hated it. She just really disliked hugs and kisses. And so that's what, and so, you know, we went to Tennessee. The book has us, we, we're going, we go to Tennessee. And then when my mother tries to kiss her, she puts up her hand and says, no kiss. <laughs> and so my parents just laughed and we laughed about it. And so it, you know, the running joke was every time we would they would see Malia, she'd put her hand up and say no kiss. You know, or they, or they would say no kiss. <laughs> it was just it was just funny. We would laugh, but that was part of her her sensory issue. You know, with having that to to touch, she did not like kisses and all of those hugs and and so and a lot of people that's how they show affection. Mm-hmm is to kiss you and hug you, but there are other ways. 
Sure. Mm, give a high five or a nice smile or say, you know, say something encouraging or even a pat on the back, you know, it maybe, you know, just not too close or something like that. There are other ways besides hugging and kissing someone to show your affection. And now that we're in the age of with this pandemic and everything, you know, there are no kisses and hugs. <laughs> So it's a perfect time not only for children that have sensory issues to touch, but just living living life because there is there no no one's kissing and hugging anyone right, right now, right? Hardly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you bring up a good a good point. First off, um, uh, you know, I, I applaud your your parents because they seem to have have had the the perfect response. Uh, to Lily in in that they laughed about it and they embraced it, whereas I think a lot of people would would be upset and felt rejected and what's wrong with you? You're stuck up and what's you know do you don't like you know all that kind of stuff, which just makes the situation worse. It's 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 hard to understand because as you say, you know, so typically typically that's the way we show affection and. We give a big hug, we give a big kiss, and we don't understand that that for some people, um, I have a, a, an acquaintance that has sens- sensory issues, it is actually painful for her yeah. when people hug her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. And, and I don't think we understand. Do do we have an uh, – and, and there are a lot of kids who are – um, have uh, sen- sensory issues to, to sound, loud noises, and uh, bright mm-hmm. lights. Do we have an idea of what is going on, either neurologically or physiologically? You know, they, there really isn't a lot of research on on that. Um, it's sometimes some people or some researchers think that it's hereditary. And sometimes, and then some, I've read that some people think that it's just how your brain is wired. And a lot of times, parents, when they are confused about why their child is acting in a certain way, is because they might have a different sensory issue or a different, or a difference. Because, like, we all have a little something, like, some people don't, can't stand a, tag in the back of their shirt or Mm -hmm. they hate the nails on the chalkboard or there are certain foods that taste weird in their mouths, you know. So uh, some people don't like their food touching, so which would be a visual sensory issue Mm -hmm. or a difference. So uh, I think most people have some type of sensory issue, but it doesn't rise, it doesn't rise to being a a diagnosis or anything like that. It's just a little something that they might have that they can ignore or get through. Um, but when a child, when it's extreme and it interfere, interferes with the child's life or that they have difficulty functioning, that's when you might want to see a therapist mm-hmm. or talk to your doctor about getting some help. If you find that it is 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 hurting you, as far as going to school or your job or your friends, and it's interfering with your life in some kind of way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, but yeah, we, I, I, you know, they really don't know. And but I do think, like, I know I was clumsy when I was little. Now I know I had proprioceptive and some um, vestibular sensory issues. Now I know. As, as a child, I didn't know. My parents didn't know. Mm-hmm. My dad was like. How is Gigi making those A's and D's in school and she's running into walls? Because I would literally run into walls and I would just, I was just really clumsy. And so my daughter wasn't necessarily clumsy, but she was real heavy. And I was something called heavy handed, Mm -hmm. which is like force. It's one of the hidden sensory issues. It's proprioceptive sensory issues. And it's where you don't know how much force to use to do something when like if you're pouring some lemonade okay we know about how much force we need to fill the 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 glass Mm -hmm. so if you have your if you have um over sensitive or under sensitive to proprioceptive sensory issues 
you wouldn't know how much force to give it. You would either give it too much or not enough. And so, and that would, that would, um, cross over to, um, pushing, pushing a buggy or, or, uh, walking and you're in it. And those type of people, they have, they can't, you know, they have no body awareness. Like you and I, you know, I can feel my hand and my feet and all of that. But when a person has proprioceptive sensory issues, it's like a hidden vestibular and proprioceptive or hidden sensory issues. So it's like you have your your hand and you just, you know, you can't really feel yourself. You have no body awareness. It's like imagine, you know, how your foot falls asleep sometimes and Uh you tap your foot Mm -hmm. just to see that it's there. Well, that's similar to these profi- these children with proprioceptive sensory issues. You know, you'll see them just tapping, and they just need to feel that their foot's there. Or when they're walking, like a blind person, you know, how they you, they touch the wall to mm-hmm. feel the wall when they're trying to find their way. Well, these children with proprioceptive sensory issues, they're touching the wall just to feel. You know, they're the kid that when you're – when you're having um, in groups, they're always reaching over and are bumping into people, and they're just not aware that they're even bothering anyone. I remember when Lily was little, she could go into her little preschool and knock over everything off of the table with her body and not even realize it. So it's it's yeah, it's body awareness and. The, and I try to encourage people, zero to three is optimal change. So if you see any any of these type of sensory issues or any type of issues in your children when they're little, it's it, early intervention is the best intervention. Mm. And so, um, but yeah, I, so we basically getting answering the original question. No one really knows for sure, but um, I, I, I will say I understood when my child used too much force, but the whole um, hugging and kissing, not liking that, I didn't get because I am huggy, kissy, <laughs> oh, I love you, can squeeze you to death, you know, kind of person, and my daughter did not want any of that, wanted no parts of it. <laughs> Even when she was a baby, she wanted to explore and get down and look around. And, you know, she just never cared for any of that. So that was odd to me because mm-hmm. I didn't have that sensory issue. Wow. It's, it's fascinating. Now, is this something, do, do, uh, are, are kids with these severe sensory issues, are they uh, considered to be fall somewhere on the autism spectrum? Again, it depends on if it interferes, if it's interfering with their livelihood. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, some people can have sensory issues and not necessarily have, be on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in my opinion, I think we're all somewhere on there, to be honest with you. (laughs) But, but, um, so, they don't necessarily have to be on, on the on the autism spectrum or or even the SBD the uh, sensory processing disorder spectrum to have sensory issues because mm-hmm. uh, again I think we all have some type but it it would just depend on your child or you because there are you know I I have a friend a friend whose wife's brother has since you know when I was telling them about my book she's like you are describing my brother he and she was just telling me some things about him but he was he's like older he's probably you know well in his 50s and he was never diagnosed with anything but he had so many issues as an adult because his sensory issues were never never attended to Mm -hmm. so he you know, he had diff- issues at work, issues in his personal life. You know, he was never diagnosed with anything. and But he had a whole lot of sensory issues. Mm. And 
So, yes, it was quite fast. I said, you should just take my book and let him read it and just, you know, just to see it, what he thinks. And, and she said that they've tried to encourage him maybe to see someone. And, you know, at this point, he's set in his ways. It's like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. But, mm-hmm. you know, clearly – there was just listening to her talk about him i could tell i was over there trying to diagnose him (laughs) and i'm not a diagnostician i'm a mom you know (laughs) you know i am an educator and i have a master's degree but not in that but i i feel like i know kids i've researched sensory issues because that speech delay later on my daughter was diagnosed with hyperlexia and so I've, so, you know, I have researched a lot because of my child, but, I, you know, I'm no diagnostician either. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I, it was clear to me that he had sensory issues and that he probably had, he probably did have a, in his case, because it affected his life the way it did, that he had some undiagnosed um undiagnosed something, you know, Uh autism, um, sensory processing disorder. There was something that he had that was undiagnosed, I feel. Yeah, it's, well, you know, you're not a a diagnostician, but you are um, uh, a caring, sensitive human being, and that's something that comes through clear as, as you're speaking. And and I think that's one of the things uh, that a family could could talk about as they're reading your books with their kids is just uh, helping them understand that that people are different and that people are some people have um, uh, hypersensitivity to certain things and that that is something that we should all respect and also have some empathy for. Um, before we go any further, you mentioned the word hyperlexia, and that's not a word that I'm familiar with. I did a quick, you know, Google search as we were speaking, and can you talk a little bit about that? Because I have a feeling that there's a lot of folks out there who've not heard that word before. Sure, hyperlexia. Hyperlexia is it literally translates to hyper reading. My child, like I described, had. Uh, as she was, I could tell she was very smart when she was little, mm-hmm. and but she wasn't talking that much. And I was like, I talk all the time. She should be talking more. <laughs> My husband is quiet. You know, one of us has to listen. And I was like, something's not right. So I went to First Steps, which is an early intervention program. Every state usually has an early intervention program for children zero to three. And the goal is that no child have a um, any type of developmental delays. Any type of de- de- delay. So zero to three is is deemed as having the optimal change. So you you want to try to get any any problem that a child could have. Um, you want to address it as early as you can. You, you know, denial is a very bad thing. So, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, when I was pregnant, I prayed that I would not be in denial. So, um, we had her evaluated, and they said she had a speech delay. So, I was like, okay. Well, I noticed that she, like at 18 months, she was 18 months, and we had the little plastic rubbery numbers that would be in the bathtub, you know, and we watched Baby Einstein, and we just read a lot. And she was always intrigued with the book, I mean, hyper-focused on books and letters as a baby. I mean, just it was just fascinating to her. So at 18 months, she knew her numbers to five, not one, two, three, four, five, but this is a three, mm-hmm. that three, five. One, out of order. She knew those numbers. I was just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. Well, she, I bought her something called Fridge Phonics when she was two. And she started to manipulate it. And, you know, it was on, some letters were on the table one day. I said, now, Lily, I need you to keep this on. The refrigerator, mommy wants it in the refrigerator. I said, well, what's this letter? S. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, what's that? T E. She knew all the letters. Wow. I was like, oh, my God. 
I mean, the girl was two, okay? And she only had it, like, three days. Yep. Three days to a week she had that. And she knew every letter in the in the alphabet. And I was like, oh, my God, really? I mean, and, but she wasn't talking that much, but she knew all those letters. And then when she was two and a half, her cousin came, I would invite people to come, come read to the baby, you know, kind of uh-huh. thing. And I would read, you know, the more re- you read, the better reader you become. And, and her cousin had reading issues, and she was eight. And she was like, well, I don't read that well. I said, it's okay, honey. I said, the more re- you read, the better reader you become. And, you know, and the baby will love it. So she came over to read to Malia. She was two and a half. And some of the words she didn't know, well, Malia told her, oh, that's cock-a-doodle-doo. Oh, that's, she knew the words to the, I was like, oh, my God. I mean, it was just shocking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people might say, oh, she just memorized it, which is what I told our cousin. Mm-hmm. But the truth was we read different books. So we never read the same book twice, you know, mm-hmm. over and over again. We mm-hmm. never did that. But she knew the words. And so, anyway, eventually we had her evaluated you know because when she we with the speech the sensory issues and all of those things you know and she was you know we had her in like the little sports just to try to help her with her eye contact because she was always looking at people with her eye contact and you know being social learning how to play with others those kind of things but um so when she was five we had her officially diagnosed, and they said hyperlexia, which is, like I said, hyperreading. She read early. It is, uh, it is, you know, there's arguments whether it's on the spectrum or not. Some people see it as part of autism, mm-hmm. like a splinter scale of autism. Um, there's a doctor, Dr. Telford, I believe his name is, he coined the phrase hyperlexia 1, 2, and 3. So hyperlexia is 1. One is where a child just reads early and reads fast and doesn't have any autistic-like traits. Um, Hyperlexia, too, he said, is when a child does have autism and hyperlexia is a splinter scale. And then hyperlexia, three, is where he feels that a child has autistic-like traits that fade away. Mm -hmm. Now, the psychologist felt like she had hyperlexia three. And true to true, um, a lot of that did, you know, seem to fade off. Like, um, you know, with therapy, of course, she had therapy and all of that up until the beginning of second grade. And, um, she, you know, she only just had speech therapy, and she did it sailed at school. I mean, her teachers loved her. She loved them. She did really well in school. And but then when you know when we hit high school, and she's going to a very uh, prominent high school, um, Dupont Manual High School, and. It is, uh, you know, it's number one in the state. It's nationally ranked. But there she had a true challenge for the first time ever. And she she made four A's and three B's the first semester, but she was struggling. It was like it was all do it. She just, it was overwhelming. And um, I had talked to the, the counselor about the fact that she, had hyperlexia and and all of that and uh you know but anyway so we so you know they worked with us and work and we worked through all that but yeah so hyperlexia is hyper reading you know children that they they have photographic memories they read early and they do have autistic like traits uh-huh. and um so yeah, I, I think the the important, and I'm glad that you mentioned that your daughter is is still working hard, but she is succeeding and she's thriving. And uh, I, I think the important takeaway from our conversation today is get that if if there's something that 
concerns you about your child, get the child evaluated as as early as possible and get that intervention and support because it's mm-hmm. out there and with the with the support with the education uh you know um your daughter was lucky that you are an educator and and you had a background but it, you know you don't need a master's degree to to support your kid and and to work with therapists and and, mm-hmm. and doctors and and so you can get the help that your kid needs um well, I, I have right. a feeling that we could talk forever. This is such a fascinating subject, but I know folks are going to want to know where they can go to, uh, to, to find your Adventures of, of Lily book series. So uh, where can folks connect with you online? You can connect with me on my website, and it's my name. It's www.jennoonspalding.com. And all of my other information's on my website, and um, my books are available on Amazon and um, Goodreads. And um, my my last book, Jump Ween, is avail- also available on Barnes and Noble online, and um, which that's a Halloween book, so that would be perfect to get right now. But my my new book, No Kiss No Hug, is actually in pre order right now on Amazon for four ninety nine. People can get that on Kindle, and it's going to be released November the first. Excellent. We've had a fascinating time speaking to the author of the Adventures of Lily series, Jen Moon Spalding. Jen, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful experience. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be C.B. Lee. She will be here to celebrate the latest in the Minecraft novel series. You know, novels that are based on that great Minecraft game. The latest novel is called The Shipwreck. It's a really, really fun interview. I learned a whole lot more about Minecraft, and I love C.B. Lee. You're going to love her, too. That's the next episode of the Reading With You Kids podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. First, want to thank our guest, Jen Moon Spalding. Please check out the adventures of Lily. I also want to thank my team, starting with Alejandro Doherty. Fatima Khan. I want to thank Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, I want to thank you. You are the reason we're doing this show. You're working so hard. You're, you're, you're going to work. You're home with the kids. You're helping your kids learn virtually. You're, you're your kid's best friend. You're their Uber driver. You're their chef. You're the world. You're the bomb. Thank you so very much. You are making the world a better place. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.